ಪ್ರಾರಂಭಿತ ಎಸ್ ಎನ್ ಮಹಾವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯ ನಾಂಪಲ್ಲಿ ಹೈದರಾಬಾದ್ ಐ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ರಿಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿಶ್ವಜಿತ್ ಪೌಲ್ ಅಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಹಿ ವಿಲ್ ಡೆಲಿವರ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಆನ್ ಇನ್ನೋವೇಷನ್ ಆನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೂಮೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟೀಸ್ ಐ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಪರಮೇಶ್ವರಿ ಗಾರು ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಟು ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ವಿಶ್ವಜಿತ್ ಪಾಲ್ ಗಾರು ಓವರ್ ಟು ಪರಮೇಶ್ವರಿ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಒನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಮೈ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಪ್ಲೆಜರ್ ಟು ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿಶ್ವಜಿತ್ ಪಾಲ್ ಯು ಜಿ ಸಿ ಅಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಡಿವೋಯ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಐ ವಿಶ್ ಟು ಸೇ ಫ್ಯೂ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿಶ್ವಜಿತ್ ಪಾಲ್ ಗಾರು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿಶ್ವಜಿತ್ ಪಾಲ್ ಅವಾರ್ಡೆಡ್ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ನ್ಯೂಯಾರ್ಕ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಎ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಸರ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟೆಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಎಂ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ದ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿಕ್ ಆರ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಷನಲ್ ಪೊಸಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಹೋಲ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿಶ್ವಜಿತ್ ಪಾಲ್ ಆರ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫೋರ್ಟೀನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಬಿಗಮ್ ವುಮೆನ್ಸ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಎ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಟು ಫೋರ್ಟೀನ್ ಪೋಸ್ಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಮಿಶಿಗನ್ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಎ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಟು ಲೆವೆನ್ ಟೀಚಿಂಗ್ ಅಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ನ್ಯೂಯಾರ್ಕ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಎ ಸೊ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಮೆಕ್ ರ್ಯಾಕ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫೆಲೋ ಫಾರ್ ಗ್ರಾಜ್ಯುಯೇಟ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ನ್ಯೂಯಾರ್ಕ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಎ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾರಿಜನ್ ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ ಇನ್ ನ್ಯಾಚುರಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಿಸಿಕಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸಸ್ ನ್ಯೂಯಾರ್ಕ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಎ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಲೆವೆನ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಅವಾರ್ಡೆಡ್ ಡಿ ಎಸ್ ಟಿ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೈರ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕಲ್ಟಿ ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ತರ್ಟೀನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮೀರಾ ಮೆಮೋರಿಯಲ್ ಗೋಲ್ಡ್ ಮೆಡಲ್ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫೋರ್ ಹಿಸ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇಂಟರ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಸಿಂಥಸಿಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರೈಸೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ಮಾಲಿಕ್ಯೂಲ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಬಯೋ ಕಾಂಜುಗೇಷನ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಪೆಪ್ಟೈಡ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪೆಪ್ಟೈಡಿಕ್ ಫೋಲ್ಡಮರ್ಸ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಅಸೆಂಬ್ಲಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಮಾಲಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ರಿಕಗ್ನೈಷನ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀರ್ ರಿವ್ಯೂಡ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಹೆಚ್ ಇಂಡೆಕ್ಸ್ ಲೆವೆನ್ ಟೋಟಲ್ ಸೈಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ತ್ರೀ ನೈಂಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಹಿಸ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಯು ಜಿ ಸಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಅಪ್ ಯು ಜಿ ಸಿ ಗ್ರಾಫ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಹ್ಯಾಲೋಜನ್ ಬಾಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಪೆಪ್ಟೈಡಿಕ್ ಫೋಲ್ಡಮರ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಂಕ್ಷನಲ್ ಅಪ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಡಿ ಎಸ್ ಟಿ ವುಮೆನ್ ಸೈಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಕೀಮ್ ಎ ಅಂಡ್ ಕ್ರಾಫ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡರಿ ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರ್ ಇನ್ ಪೆಪ್ಟೈಡಿಕ್ ಆಲಿಗೋಮರ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಮೋಟಿಂಗ್ ಮ್ಯಾಕ್ರೋಸ್ ಸೈಕ್ಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸ್ಕಾಫೋಲ್ಡ್ ಡೈವರ್ಸಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ ಡಿ ಎಸ್ ಟಿ ಪ್ರಮೋಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕ್ ಎಕ್ಸಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಸರ್ ಟೀಚಿಂಗ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಜಾನ್ವರಿ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಟು ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ನೌ ಟೋಟಲ್ ಫೋರ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ವರ್ ಎನ್ರೋಲ್ಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಅಂಡರ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಸೂಪರ್ವಿಸನ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಔಟ್ ರೀಚ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವರ್ಕ್ಶಾಪ್ಸ್ ವರ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸ್ ಬೈ ಹಿಮ್ ಅಟ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಷನ್ಸ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ನೌ ಓವರ್ ಟು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವಿಶ್ವಜಿತ್ ಪಾಲ್ ಸರ್ ಯು ಕೆನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ so you can
Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Then I will. Uh, I will uh, do one thing. I will just log in through another way. Sir, sir. So right now there is a lot of uh, background. Okay. So I have joined through another way. Yes. What I will do is that I'm now logging through my phone. Uh, you may give me uh, the co-host for my name. So I have joined through two ways. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Sir. Okay. Please can. So, yeah. Uh, I am hopefully I am audible, but uh, the, this is the issue that happens. So that's why I wanted to you know, make sure that uh, we are in the same page. So, uh, good morning, all. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sir, for inviting me, uh, uh, giving uh, a talk on the innovation on instrumentation practices. Uh, so I'm going to talk today in the morning uh, on one of the uh, important innovation that has happened in chemical sciences on the aspects of uh, separation of science. So with that, uh, what I wanted to you know, highlight, uh, there are a lot of things that are going on in the context essentially for the uh, HPLC, which is the high performance liquid chromatography. And what are the applications that is coming out with it? Uh, uh, so just to start with all that, at any point of time, you know, all our teachers here. So at any point of time, if any of you feel that you are not understanding something or I'm not very clear, you please stop me. Uh, you know, it's not like I'm giving a lecture to a students where I say whatever I want and then nobody asks me any question. Here you have full uh, freedom of asking me, stopping me at any point of time. Uh, my usual problems of, you know, logging in through the computer always creates problems. I always create a backup of having my phone, but I think my slides are visible or it is still having um, issues. Yes, sir. They are very clear, sir. Please go. Okay. Okay, so uh, with that, what I will do is that I will go to the, uh, the second part of the, the discussion, which is essentially the topic that I wanted to discuss with all of you, uh, which is HPLC. And there are essentially four ways by which the liquid chromatography, which works. And I'm calling it liquid chromatography and we are all chemistry uh, teachers here. And I'm sure that you have either heard of it or you have done uh, while doing your research or you might be continuing your research. Um, uh, depending on that, you have used this, uh, this separation technique. And uh, the one that I am going to talk about is reverse phase, but the one that we have been doing it from long time was normal phase, adsorptions, ion exchange, and size exclusion. So these are the four words, and all of them has a specific property. Because I'm not discussing the others, but I'll briefly mention about them. The normal phase is the one that is, we always call it as a column chromatography using silica gel. And they essentially works on the principle of adsorptions and the mobile phase uh, and the stationary phase polarity difference and the retention of the compounds. Whereas the ion exchange essentially depends on the electrostatic nature of the compounds. Size exclusion on the other hand depends on the property like how big or small the compound is. If the compound is too big, and then what happens is that it takes longer time to come out. Whereas if the compound is too small, then it comes out very quickly in size exclusion chromatography. The one that we are going to discuss today is a reverse phase, high performance liquid chromatography. I did not use the word reverse phase in my um, presentation. The obvious reason is that is not the HPLC that we normally use. We all been using mostly the 
liquid chromatography as such. But reverse phase is just that typically we use normal phase, whereas the reverse phase mentions here is essentially opposing the polarity because organic compounds mostly likes organic solvents. Whereas the reverse phase, the compounds are mostly biologically friendly, which means that it is soluble in water, methanol, acetonitriles, which are very, very polar solvents. So because of that polarity difference in the normal phase versus the reverse phase, we have given a different name to the normal phase system as a reverse phase. That is the just difference in terms of the polarity. Now, uh, just to give you a brief sense about the whole HPLC system, here is an HPLC system. It's a very high-end equipment uh, for you to really look into it. If you have logged into through your phone, like the way I'm doing it, you can actually zoom certain area and see which I'm talking about. So what I will do is that, you know, um, uh, the mouse also I don't have to essentially show you. So I'll have to basically tell you left of the slide, right of the slides and things like that. So what I'm going to do is that there is a, a, a picture given for the HPLC and that looks like, you know, the microwave or the fridge that we normally buy nowadays in the, uh, you know, shopping malls and all. That's how the designs of HPLC also looks like. But the inside, there are a lot of uh, signs involved. Just like the way microwave, there are a lot of science involved. There are a lot of science involved in uh, refrigerator as well. So uh, overall, the uh, three or four things I'm going to talk. The last part, I'm not really going to, to tell too much, but I still put it on. Uh, the first is I'm just go going to give you a brief history how the chromatography started. And then slowly go into the each component of the liquid chromatography, especially the um, high performance reverse phase chromatography. And then the automated one, which is nowadays everybody uses, which is called flash chromatography. And the last one is this hyphenated one where we put LC and then we put a dash. That's why we call it hyphenated. We call it LC, like HPLC. So HP is high performance liquid chromatography. UPLC is ultra performance liquid chromatography. And then there are LCMS, GCMS, all kinds of hyphenated systems that we can discuss. And I'm going to only talk few things um, on that aspect. Now, left side is uh, one of the very high model of Waters. Waters is one of the prominent uh, HPLC um, seller and uh, innovator in designing HPLC for a long period of time. And I have put waters in the uh, slide is just that because I have taken their uh, photos. And I want to make a very clear in the beginning, I am not a salesperson of waters. You are free to buy anything you want in terms of um, you know, HPLC. I have taken their proprietary images. That's why I have to cite them. On the right hand side is also one of the higher end that is existing nowadays with uh, Shimadzu. So essentially, there are many varieties of HPLC are coming out. And once I discuss with you the HPLC, the whole model that you are seeing, inside the content is very simple. Outside the content looks very, very complicated, but inside the contents are very, very simple. And in terms of the history, this is something very profound because otherwise how that name came, how the chromatography name came. It is actually devised by one of the Russian scientists in 1901, uh, Professor Mikhail Zwet. What uh, Zwet essentially did is that he took the uh, some leaves of a plant, crushed it, and put it into ethanol and uh, ether as one of the um, solvent system, by which they have essentially uh, yeah, and put it on through the column. The column contains mostly silica and he has passed through that. While passing through, because the uh, liquid, the leaf of a plant mostly are green, you can see they are getting different kinds of bands. And although the picture is not what Zoet might have done, but the idea of Zoet is that Zoet was the first one who essentially started this chromatography. And as usual with all the leaps, you have typically keratinoids as one of the components, chlorophyll as one of the components. And he was able to separate two of these components out during the process. 
and uh, and very cleverly i don't know whether it is a clever or not he has included his name in chromatography uh, just like the way we have uh, when we devise one um, name reaction uh, scientists typically used to give their name uh, but zwet little bit clever in the way that he has put his name uh, in a way where zwet means color or, or chromatography uh, and that's how the chromato word has essentially come from um, Michael Zwet. <clears throat> I think, sir, well, one or two people are having some microphone open. If you mute them, uh, then uh, there will be no background. Yeah. Yeah, one background noise is, but it's much less now. No problem. So uh, with this premise, uh, the Mikhail Zwet essentially started this whole chromatography. And how does now the chromatography is shaping? And I'm sure you have seen this. Um, this is a simplistic uh, paper chromatography system, which is, I think you might have done or you might have seen where we spot samples onto, the, onto a strip of paper or a strip with, with a silica gel and uh, spot in three dots, for example, in this case, and then we put into a certain solvent. And after a while, we find that the spot has got separated depending on the polarity of the solvents, depending on the uh, polarity of the compounds. It's a combination of both. And the thing that is attached with the paper is essentially stationary phase. And the mobile phase is essentially the solvent, which is carrying those um, samples up. And depending on the polarity and depending on the compound nature, it separates into three, for example. Uh, the solvent is one of the critical thing for liquid chromatography separation to happen. Uh, and this technique that we have been doing it for a long time is there in the normal phase. And I will show you how is the same principle applies in the reverse phase. Now, this is with the uh, chromatography system that we have done for the paper chromatography. And this, this is one of the systems you might have seen or you might have done during your research on the left hand side with certain, um, and then let the uh, compound run through uh, with a particular solvent. And after a while, you see different bands, like in this case, red and yellow. Those bands essentially means that at that particular solvent, the two uh, samples are essentially separated because uh, chromatography is a science of separation of mixture, nothing else. And I'll give you the definition as I'm going along. But uh, you can understand that's why we always discuss chromatography. And I can assure you, mostly the organic chemists spend most of their research time in doing the separations. It's easy to do the reaction is easy to set up a reaction, but it's always a, a tricky and a difficult business to separate the molecule. And that's how the chromatography has come up with one of the most innovative ways of doing uh, science of separation. Uh, in this case, the peak that is mentioned is showing some value to absorbance, which means they have used UV as a detector. And these are the terms that I'm going to use and explain to you. They are called it modules in the chromatography system. And the mostly people doesn't like chromatography when they say they either get scared, it's mainly because when they see this kind of terminologies. And for me, I have learned chromatography like a user where I know how to separate the molecule rather than knowing all the features in the molecule. Because I think knowing too much sometimes prohibits you to do the work. So I always insist because we are a teacher, we need to know how to do things. Otherwise we cannot let the student understand how things can be done. If I just show that, see there is a equipment looks like a fridge, just go and inject it and you will get your compounds out. You will never get a compounds out. You have to explain to the students how the um, separation can be done. And then only the student gets the courage to do it. Uh, and we might be teaching in the BSc, in the PG, or in the, in the research labs in different places if you're trying to establish a lab like the way I'm trying to establish my own lab. 
uh, where we have to be very, very hands-on. If you just know the theory, sometimes I think you are not really good enough to go further um, onto it. But nonetheless, I don't want to put, put you off by knowing this many terminologies, but I will work with the terminologies which is necessary. And most of the terminologies I have put up is going to be covered as we go along. And sometimes you might not be knowing exactly the name of the terminologist, but you might be knowing how the terminology is used. That is, I think, is more important. Sometimes people say RF. RF is nothing but retention factor. That is there in the uh, normal phase. That is there in the reverse phase. But if I just say RF, 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 you will sometimes get confused and you might feel like something is wrong. But RF is the one that we actually just discussed previously where we showed that the molecule can be separated and they have some specific value. And the way people can calculate RF is also something too we need to understand. Uh, but you know, these are certain things uh, which actually stops people not to do um, HPLC work. But uh, I don't want to go into that. Uh, the reason is most of the HPLC systems look scary. But if you go into the HPL system and try to understand it, it's very, very simple. On the left-hand side is an HPLC system that you will typically see in case of um, the uh, Agilent uh, system. Yes, sir, uh, in case of the Agilent system. Now, uh, with the Agilent system, the interesting thing is that the, uh, the systems are stacked rather like the way waters have used, waters have looked it like more like a fridge. Whereas the um, Agilent and Shimadzu, uh, which are the bunch of um, companies on the right-hand side as a manufacturer, like Waters, Agilent, Thermo Fisher, Jasco. These are the many different kinds of um, manufacturers, which essentially makes um, the high performance liquid chromatography for a long period of time. Now, Left hand side is how the HPLC looks. That's how Agilent makes. That's how Shimadzu makes. And I haven't seen Thano Fisher um, HPLC yet, but I can say that they will not look too diff uh, different either. But if you go into the interior on the left hand side picture, you will find the skeletons of the HPLCs are essentially the pump, which essentially draws this uh, solvent from the bottles. And then from the pump, it pushes through the column, which is that the number five mentioned there. And from that column, essentially the separation happens and you see it on a screen, which is on the number seven. And then ultimately, if certain things you don't like to see, it goes to the waste, which is on the, uh, the uh, right-hand side, there is a small bottle that is put as a waste. In other words, if you think of how you have run your column chromatography, you have taken a, a burette-like um, system, you have put silica gel, you have loaded your column with some solvents, and then you have put your samples, and then you have put the solvents to the top. And that's how you have been doing it manually. Whereas in the HPLC, these things are automated, which means the pumps allows you to draw the solvent and then run through the column and then get the separation. So it's other words, what you're essentially trying to do with the HPLC system is a little bit more automated than what you do normally in the lab day to day, including the smaller system like paper chromatography or the uh, you know silica gel plate based chromatography. Uh, and the chromatography is essentially is the signs of separation, the chemical compound that are present in the sample, which I was telling you. So signs of separation that give some color, we call it chromatography. Now color is something like, you know, you will always think uh, I'm not seeing all my compounds are colored. The reason is if it is falling in the UV, you will not see them. If it is falling in the visible, you will see them because uh, as a human with our eye, we can only see visible uh, light. We cannot see UV lights but almost all the compounds will either have UV lights or has um, visible. And I will uh, work on that aspect, which is called chromophores. Then I'll come to there. If your sample has chromophore, you will see by UV or you will see by visible, just by naked eyes. 
If your sample doesn't have chromophore, then we have to derivatize them. Just like using iodine stain, permanganate stains, um, anisaldehyde stains. There are many stains by which you can essentially um, see the uh, compounds. But in the case of chromatography, particularly the high performance chromatography, we essentially see the molecule through some kind of a chromophore. And I can tell you more than 70, 80% of organic compounds will have chromophore. Only 20 to 30% doesn't have chromophore. For that, we have to do the stain. But there are methods by which you can essentially also put chromophore in the molecule. If you think of it, there are many molecules you might have studied, they don't have chromophore as such. For example, a very big molecule like um, steroids. Steroids, if they don't have any kind of a particular um, uh, chromophore into it, you will not see them. Sugars doesn't have a chromophore. So you have to stain them through uh, H2SO4, for example. You have to char it to see how does it look. Most of the time it looks like a black colored compound. So in a way, what I was, is my slides getting, yes, okay. So uh, the modules in the HPLC, now I'm trying to essentially zoom into the multiple uh, regions of it. In one of the regions, you will see on the left-hand side, you have two conical flux, which is called solvent A, solvent B, where you essentially put two different solvents. And then you have two pumps, which looks like this yellowish colored thing, which has this two pump system, which essentially takes the two solvents from those two conical flasks and then mixes it. There's a mixture, a mixer, which essentially mixes the two solvent depending on the polarity that we are after. And then you inject the sample before the mixing, after the mixing happens to push it to the column. As you push it to the column, the column has the ability to separate. And as it is separating in the column and it comes at different time points. And I'm going to come to that part also as I go along. But for time being, I'm just telling you how the column works because I'm going to explain to you the solvents, the pumps, the columns, and the detector, which are essentially the four components of HPLC. And the major two components of HPLC are solvent and the column. There are four components. Any HPLC you look at, there are only four components. Solvents, what is your pump, what is your column, and what is your detector. And two are the more critical. What solvent system we want, what kind of column we want, and finally, how do you see them, which is by detector. And mostly the UV is the detector, common detector we use. There are also other detectors which I'll also talk about briefly. And then there is a mass detector. By mass also you can detect. Nowadays people have do LCMS, which is liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. In other words, the detector is a mass, not the um, uh, UV. And why detector is a mass? Because not all compounds have chromophore. So you don't have to stain them, but you can see them by mass and most of the compounds are separated by the mass. Now, if you go into the uh, details part of the HPLC, why we wanted to do HPLC is the separation. If we cannot separate a molecule, then we cannot isolate them because in a mixture form, the compounds are mostly useless unless you separate them. And I would not say all compounds are useless in a mixture form. I will say most of the compounds are useless in a mixture form. Why? because you will not be make it used for something that we want. But interestingly, after separating them, when we want some compound, we mix them again. But what is the difference between previous mixing by this mixing? The previous mixing, I was not knowing what is the component in A, B, C, D. But after mixing, I know how much of A I have put, how much of B I have put, how much of C I have put, and so on and D. So therefore that gives you the exact control on the compound system. That's why we need separation and that's why we need mixture also. So overall, you know, things are not that simple. But here is a case that I'm trying to mention in the context of resolution. HPLC allows you to resolve your system very, very easily. How does it do? Because the columns nowadays are made by machines and they pack it so well that unlike our manual packing, the HPLC packing allows you to essentially see the compound going through the uh, overall system. And as you go through the overall system, 
you will find that the peaks are getting separated. The peaks on the left hand side is less retained, whereas the peaks on the right hand side is more retained. What is the meaning of retention? The one which essentially uh, allows you to look into the uh, peak separation. And that separation of the peaks is nothing but resolution. So HPLC allows you a very good resolution of your samples. Whereas the manual packing and the manual flow of the compound through the normal columns that we do, it doesn't allow you to do the separation. Now, if you go to the, uh, the second part of it, which is the solvent system, because the HPLC has these four systems, the solvent systems, the pump, the column, and the detector. The pumps are mostly mechanical. As a chemist, we don't really need to know, but we need to know what is our solvents because without that, we will not be able to have a good separation. Why? On the left-hand side, you can see the molecules that exist mostly polar. And on the right-hand side, what are the molecules that we normally see existing as a non-polar? And depending on that polarity, we have to use different kinds of um, system. If the compounds are polar, we need to choose mobile phase like water, acetonitriles, and so on. If the compound is non-polar, then we have to uh, choose solvents like hexane, ethyl acetate, ether, dichloromethanes, and all. So depending on the compounds, you will have this good idea about how to separate them. Now, if you ask that, Sir, how do I know which compound is polar and non-polar? And that is very easy to do. If you are a chemist, we like to see the chemical structure. By looking at the chemical structure, particularly the organic chemist, I have nothing against inorganic chemist or physical chemist. Uh, they are also chemists. But organic chemist, on the other hand, likes to see the chemical structure. On the other hand, inorganic, uh, analytical, and physical chemists, they are most on the sides of you know, the systems, which are either complexes, or mostly you know, mathematics or physics-based subjects where they deal with mostly metrologies and all, not too much chemical structures. Too many chemical structures are dealt by chemists. And that's why when you um, talk with organic chemists, they like to see the chemical structure, whether you have drawn it in chem draw, whether it is hand-drawn, um, that will not really do much. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say overall that, you know, the, uh, the kinds of molecule that you are putting, that will help you to choose which solvent to use. If it is non-polar uh, compounds, you choose non-polar uh, uh, solvent systems. Now, how do I know? The polarity is essentially comes from the functional groups. If you have compound with hydroxyls, carboxyls, nitros, they tends to be polar. Whereas the compounds which are like hydrocarbons, um, uh, halogens, they typically non-polar. So looking at the compounds and the functional groups, it allows you to choose which particular solvents you should go for. And the molecule that I'm going to talk about mostly is the reverse phase, where we use water, acetonitrile as our solvent system. Now, if you go into a little bit of you know, the solvent gradients, because after choosing what kind of solvents that we want to do, we need to see how, how we can essentially separate the um, solvent types. We can go for isocratic or we, we can go for gradient. What is isocratic? When the solvents has a similar ratio of A and B in terms of polarity throughout the uh, run. Whereas the gradient, it starts at certain time at one gradient, which means A and B has a different ratio and goes all the way to the different ratio at the end. For example, at zero minute, you have 100% of A and 0% of B. And at 50 minutes, you have, let's say, 50% of A, 50% of B. And at 100 minutes, you have 100% of B and 0% of A. That run that you have made is a gradient run because at each point, A and B are changing its concentration. And in isocritic, on the other hand, A and B for 100 minute runs remains 100 throughout. They don't change A and B. Let's say you started with 50% A, 50% B at zero. At 50 minutes also 50% A, 50% B. At 100 minutes also, 150% A, 50% B. So throughout that A and B solvent ratios remain same. Now, if you go to the, uh, the other aspects, which is the detector, 
as i was mentioning to you the solvents is one of the key factor the detector is also another one of the key factors and nowadays with the hplc particularly we have many kinds of detector uv fluorescence reflective light scattering refractive index so many i mean i i have only used in my uh, research only uv and mass nowadays the more prominent one is the mass and the mass is good because you can remove all of them so easily you don't really need the others mass allows you to look at all the thing without looking without thinking about what kind of things i have in my system so that's why people prefer mass but there is a problem with the mass the the hplc systems are very very expensive if you have a mass in it uh, i recently uh, procured one hplc that has costed me something like 15 lakhs which is uv if i go for the similar mass one it will go to close to some 50 lakhs and depending on the money and all you essentially go for your um, system and also for your applications what you what is the reason you want to use hplc for my system the research i am planning to do and i am doing in my lab needs only uv so i was happy with it but i want mass because that allows me to test any kind of molecule any kind of system finally i would just go over very briefly with two detector which i want to talk otherwise you know you will not get the sense uh, what exactly is the uv uh, detector does and this is a typical uv spectrometry study that you might have done or you might have studied in your spectroscopy it's the similar thing applies to hplc also after choosing the particular uh, um, solvent you want to see what kind of chromophore the chromophores that we normally see has to be uh, chromophoric meaning that it has to absorb in the uv region and the typical uv regions are 200 to 400 nanometer whereas the visible goes from 400 to 800 nanometer and the uv visible spectroscopy is nothing but humoral mode transition from the humo level you excite the electron to go to the lumo level and while it comes down you essentially gets the um, the signal that comes out and the amount of energy you need to promote the electron to go from humo to the lumo is nothing but the uv and that's where the uv um, spectrometry comes in and if you did not use hplc with uv you might have used just uv which is nothing but the similar principle where you use uv light and you pass through the um, column and you also pass through the um, uh, blank and then you try to see how the uh, separation happens with the uv peaks depending on the particular wavelength where it absorbs and that's how uv allows you to look at the molecule and separate the molecule so uv allows you to see and also separate depending on the wavelength it is absorbing if all our chromophore absorbs at the same wavelength then you will not be able to separate them because they will overlap but if they have different polarity then they will separate in the column okay so with this premise you know few terminologies you might have seen in i don't want to go too much with hypsochromic uh, you know this uh, hyperchromic shift and all that it is just like essentially giving you a little bit of more idea about the uv which i don't want to really put too much um, understanding on it but you are aware of it and i'm sure as a teacher you might be teaching also this Uh, where we have seen that if you increase the number of conjugations in a molecule you can essentially make it more visible you can start with uv and it goes to visible for example the left hand side on the bottom we have ethene then butadiene and then we have all these triene system 1 3 5 hexatrienes and as you increase the number of double bonds you can see that the wave number has now got wave length now got to 460 nanometer which means you can see them and this molecule is nothing but what we see in the carrot as a beta carotene and therefore uh, we see carrot looks orange because the uh, wave wavelength where this absorption happens is falling in the uh, visible region now there is one more uh, uv detector called pd photodiode detector and this is something very very you know uh, important to know because it allows you to have now grating system unlike the uv system which essentially doesn't have the capacity to look at the molecule with single wavelength at any time so for example i have three molecules in my mixture at any point of time with uv i can see only one wavelength looking at only one molecule or three molecule at the same time 
But in the PDA, it allows me to scan at any point all the wavelength at the same time. So in other words, PDA gives me much more sensitivity than the normal UV. And what is the fundamental difference between them? The fundamental difference between UV and PDA, PDA is also UV, but in the PDA photodiode detector, at any point of time, you can scan from 200 to 400 nanometer or 200 to 800 nanometer if you're UV visible at the same time, which doesn't happen in the um, UV. In the UV, if you have set your wavelength at 240 nanometer or 230 nanometer, you just see that particular wavelength at that particular time. You don't scan the entire UV visible range from 200 to 400. And that's why PDA sometimes people like it, particularly the small molecule research likes PDA. In my lab, I don't have PDA, I have the UV because uh, my molecules are mostly peptides and they absorb at 240 nanometer. So therefore I can essentially see them only in that wavelength. I don't want to see the other wavelength. So therefore I can um, use it. And that is one reason. The other reason is the cost. The cost of the PD is a little bit like four or five lakhs more than the UV. And I mention the cost all the time because that is something very important once you try to uh, you know, purchase things uh, on your own. Then we come to the uh, choosing a column because that is also one of the key aspects uh, how to find out what columns to need. And there are many aspects. What is his efficiency? What is the pressure? What is the analysis time? How much is the volume? Because the um, uh, columns can be analytical column. Columns can be preparatory column. What is analytical column? Which just lets you see the system. Doesn't let you to isolate the system. Because I might have compound in few milligrams, like 10, 15, 20 milligrams. I want to separate them. Then I need preparatory. Whereas in analytical, I do only in the microgram to few milligrams, maybe one or two mg. And I just wanted to see the molecule. That's it. For seeing the molecules, we use analytical. For actually separating the molecule, we need a preparatory system. Now, why I'm coming to all this, because that is a critical factor by which it allows you to have the separation. Here, is the here I have shown you one column, and you can see that the columns are essentially will have silica gel. But depending on the uh, size of the, not the size in terms of the length of the column, but the size of the particle inside the column allows you to have separation. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have a column with 50, uh, five micron size with 50 mm in the length. And you have the same column with 50 mm length, but has almost one third the size of the particle inside the column. You can see that in one case, you have a baseline separation. In another case, you don't have a baseline separation. What is a baseline? The line which is actually on the bottom. If you have a baseline separation, it allows you to separate the two molecules easily. If you don't have a baseline separation, which means the two molecules are overlapping. So it is difficult to separate. So depending on the compound type, you should choose the particular column. And then if you go to the packing material, what is in the packing material? They will say, I have C8 column. They will say, I have C18 column. What is the C8 column? C8 column is nothing but what is the length of the um, uh, uh, silica, that silica that I have put, which OH in there, what is the length of the aliphatic chain that has been attached? If it is attached with the C8 length, we call it C8 column. If it is attached with C18 length, we call it C18 columns. And why should we do two different? Because if you have a very big compound, then C18 columns will hold the compound more by hydrophobic interactions. Whereas, the C8 columns will let the compound go very easy. On the other hand, if you have a hydrophilic system, you will need more C18 than C8 because C8 will let the hydrophilic compound comes out very, very quickly, whereas in the C18, it will go slow. So these are the two you know, aspects, hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity of the molecule that allows you to do that. And ultimately, why do you want to do all this? Separations. Here is a example given with six compound mixed together and you can essentially see them, the separation by injecting the column. These kind of compound, if you look at, they are very similar looking. If you do the manual uh, columns, like the way we have been running in the burette like columns, it is very difficult to separate them. If you use the HPLC system, which is high performance and gives you very good packing 
and allows you to have separation even with the similar looking molecules. I cannot guarantee that all the time you will get a separation, but I can say if you choose the light solvent, if you choose the right um, the overall uh, the column material, you can separate almost any compounds that you are looking for. Now, the ultimately there is idea about like this further automations, which I don't really like, but I still tell you because if you go to some column systems and you find, if you go to some HPLC system, you find that they're using something called a fraction collector. What is a fraction collector? It is nothing but a automatic device by which it allows you to collect small amount of solvent um, throughout the run. And you don't collect it manually, rather it is done by a um, automatic sample collector. I, in my lab, I don't have it and I don't really prescribe it also, someone um, you know, using this because I think it's unnecessary. Uh, and uh, why? You can ask her why it is unnecessary because you are going to waste a lot of your solvents. Uh, and instead you should try to preserve a lot of solvents. And uh, it's not that you know, I am very, very uh, stingy in terms of spending money, but I'm trying to give you a sense that at the same time, you'll generate a lot of waste. Where do you dump waste? In a country like ours, we are not very environmentally friendly. We dump things wherever we want. So the good thing is we don't generate the waste, rather we try to conserve it and then we do it. But you know, not all of the people think in the same way. For example, industry wants to save time. They have a lot of money power. So they want to save time. So they allows the uh, people to set up the column, run the HPLC during the night and then go home and you separate and your uh, automatic samplers essentially is going to collect your samples when you're sleeping. And you might feel like, you know, you have been very, very productive with all these things, but I don't know. I mean, productivity is the two, two different things to, you know, understand uh, just because you are sleeping, you're not working. Whereas uh, your column is working for you or your HPLC is working for you. Uh, ultimately, you know, the new wave of HPLC has given rise to these innovations. And that sort of, you know, I'm almost finishing in my uh, discussion. But this is something that you need to really take home that this LC method, be it HPLC, be it RPHPLC, which is reverse phase uh, high performance liquid chromatography. If this is an important tool that chemist has to use to essentially um, separate the compounds, particularly when the compounds are in the biological um, domains. And biological samples are very, very precious. Now in the present context of pandemic, you will find that we are now struggling to see how to find the, uh, you know, that somebody is affected by COVID or not doing the test very, very quickly. And there are many ways people are coming up with. I'm not saying HPLC is the way they are doing, but HPLC is one such way people are also using to do it. But there is a problem with the HPLC. HPLC is not as fast as other method. You need at least minutes to an hour to find out what is going on. Whereas in a, in a SAM, in a analysis like PCR method, which you all say, what is the test you are doing? We are doing RT-PCR method. It's actually the polymerase chain reaction that is much faster and much more sensitive. People likes to go for that because it's more of a biological sample. But if you really want to find out what are the fragments, how the things are going on, you have to use similar system like uh, liquid chromatograph. I'm not saying HPLC, it can be any kind of chromatograph, not only one kind. And here is a method I have mentioned here with an antibody binding to a protein and then using the LCMS method to detect. And there is an LCMS-MS method, which is essentially splitting of the target samples even more. I don't want to go into detail. If somebody has a questions, we can discuss further on this. But this is essentially what you know, I wanted to tell you before I close you with two, two new things which is coming in the HPLC world, which is that you essentially do the entire thing on the reaction mixture in a, uh, 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 in a machine instead of us doing any reaction anywhere. And that is a flow chemistry, which essentially allows two compounds to be inject through, do the reaction on the flow, and then use HPLC at the downstream to essentially separate the compound and get your compound. Here is the reaction they have set up on the left-hand side. You have essentially a, a, a esterification reaction going on. And there is no human interface except the injection. Once you inject in two ports, you get your compound on the right-hand side. 
and it looks fancy because you know you can now do everything online but uh, not all reactions can be done only few reactions can be done in this way but what is i am trying to tell you is this is what the next revolution of hplc is happening or the lc is happening where everything can be automated starting your reaction to getting the product finally i would just end with what is i have in my lab that i also have an hplc that i am also you know using it but mine is mostly uv based and this was funded by dst parts space 2 i think it is not too relevant to talk here but i'm just mentioning that something that i use in my lab and that is being uh, used almost everywhere and my system is much more uh, primitive uh, in the way that we have been doing it yeah. with that i'll just end and uh, we can have question and answer session thank you sir uh, any questions from participants any doubts clarification yeah feel free to ask you know uh, or yeah. i did not put my email but uh, sir has my email addresses and all if you want me to send in separate email as well i would be happy to answer it Yeah. Uh, thank so you, sir. Normally, no. sir, uh, I knew that st uh, student has uh, problems in asking questions. Now I'm seeing that the once the teacher becomes students, they also has problem in asking questions. So, <laughs> yeah. I request you, sir. Sir, here one question. Here, sir. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Why we? say that mass spectrometry technique as a mass spectrometry but as a remaining techniques we say as a spectroscopy oh very good excellent question yes, so this is something uh, you know uh, we make a mistake so the difference between spectroscopy and spectrometry is nothing but what you use we call uv spectroscopy because yes. we use light yes. we use ir spectroscopy because we use infrared light but in the mass we don't really use any kind of electromagnetic radiation right okay. we use yes. electron yes. beam we use polarization but we don't use any electromagnetic radiation if we do okay. not use any, any electromagnetic radiation then we really cannot see it as a spectroscopy we have to call it spectroscopy okay. Okay. okay thank you sir sure it's my privilege to pro propose the vote of thanks i thank the management for their encouragement in conducting seminars and fdb programs and my special thanks to resource person dr bishwajit pal garu for accepting our invitation and helping faculty in exposure to innovative practices in chemical sciences so from your lecture we people got very clear picture on importance of chromatography in case of chemical substances in which not having the chromophores and we have understood very clearly the importance of the selection of solvents and the advantage of uv and mass spectrometers over the hplc and uh, why because uh, generally the scientists uh, conduct right uh, research they do research to minimize the cost of the right things in that way you provided a very good idea about the usage of chromatography technique over other techniques sir your lecture on innovation on instrumentation practices was very useful i thank all the faculty for their participation in this fdp program i thank one and all please all the feedback link posted in chatted box chat box 
Thank you, each and every faculty participate in this FTP program. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. So I'm leaving right now. If any one of you have any questions, you can ask me later also. No problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Please fill the feedback form link. It is uh, posted in the chat box. Thank you each and every faculty who are participated in faculty development program. Thank you, sir.